We are glad to see you online or in person as we attend to our curricular goals here at Eden to address the sin of racism and all of its intersecting oppressions. Today, we join in the conversation at the intersection of the oppression, the sinful oppression of ableism and Christian worship. So just now, before this lecture, if you are just now joining us, we had invited Dr. Spurrier and Reverend Stevenson to share with us in an experience of anti-ableist worship from which we can all reflect and learn. And it was a powerful and wonderful service and we were all richly blessed. We are so excited, Reverend Stevenson and Reverend Spurrier, that you are here with us today. Thank you so much. So this morning's lecture began with worship. As we aim to be a place of prophetic teaching, faith, and learning here at Eden. Christopher Grundy, our professor of worship and preaching and associate dean of the chapel, is coming now to introduce the Schmeekin lecturer and worship leader, Dr. Grundy. Thank you. I have been waiting eagerly. Well, I've been waiting eagerly for the coming of the realm of God, but I've been waiting <laughs> eagerly for this day since long before we knew whether or not our guests could actually come. The idea that we might have this day um, was very exciting to me, and it is even more exciting now that it's actually happening. I am delighted to have both of our leaders uh, with us today. Reverend Stevenson was born in Newport News, Virginia and raised in Alexandria, Virginia. He is a 2015 cum laude graduate of Morehouse, he's a Morehouse man, with a BA in history. <clears throat> While at Morehouse, Kyle served as a chapel assistant, always a good formative experience for anyone in case you were wondering. He was served as a chapel assistant and served as historian of the Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel Assistance Program. He was inducted into the 2013 Academy of Young Preachers in January of 2013. On December 29, 2013, Kyle was licensed to the gospel ministry at his home church, Alfred Street Baptist Church, Alexandria, Virginia where the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley is the pastor. Kyle earned his Master of Divinity from Emory University, Candler School of Theology, in May 2018. While a seminarian at Candler, Kyle also served as an intern at the Ebenezer Baptist Church, where he has been a member under watch care since his freshman year at Morehouse through seminary. On October 27, 2019, he was ordained at the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church. Kyle earned his Master of Theology, focusing on liturgical studies from Columbia Theological Seminary in May of 2019, and received the Frederick Beekner Excellence in Writing Award. Dr. Rebecca Spurrier is Associate Dean for Worship Life and Assistant Professor of Worship at Columbia Theological Seminary. She is interested in a theology and practice of public worship that reflects the beauty and tension human difference brings to Christian liturgy. Engaging ethnographic theology, disability studies, and liturgical aesthetics, her research explores the hope of human interdependence and the importance of liturgical access for religious practice and Christian community. She is the author of The Disabled Church, Human Difference, and the Art of Communal Worship, which I recommend to you if you don't already own it, you should. 
She integrates a focus on disability studies and liturgical theology in the classroom with the formation of worship leaders through daily chapel services. I find that Dr. Spurrier's work invites us to notice a particular beauty to be found in the realm of God coming near when we are willing to not just encounter difference, but to live into it as sacred. I am certain you will be inspired today. To both of our leaders, welcome this morning. I'm going to begin by putting on a form of accommodation that will help me. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this year's Schmeekin Lecture. I am deeply honored by the invitation and grateful to the family of Reverend Samuel John Schmeekin who honor his memory and legacy through their support of these lectures. I am also grateful to so many people who have made this lecture possible, to President Kraus, to um, Dr. Niles, Dr. Wise Baker, Dr. Grundy, uh, Mr. Paul Vasil, Reverend Katie Hotso-Wilton, Katie, did I get that right? Um, Ms. Danita Carter, to Angela Bjornstad, who was signing earlier, and Jay Johnson and Kendall Moore, to, and to many others of you who I may not know your names. I'm really grateful. Um, I also want to express my gratitude to Reverend Stevenson for being part of this lecture series, coming along with me to be part of this, and to my spouse, Silas Allard, who's standing in the back, who's come to accompany me. In all, thank you to all of you for the ways you've contributed to this lecture as a practice of interdependence rather than as a solo achievement. Um, I also want to express my thanks to each of you for coming out on a Friday morning. I am honored to be in dialogue with all of you about a matter of justice that I believe is vital for the present and the future of the church. But before we go on, I just want to remind you about some ways you can participate in this lecture. So please, move in and out of the space. Lecturing is good for some of our body, maybe it's good for some of our body minds, but um, it's, it can be long. There's a lot of dense information. So please feel free to move in and out of the space. We have manuscripts of the lecture. So if you leave and come back, you can always revisit parts of it later on. Um, again, if you wanna sit on the floor or stand, if you feel it easier to kind of walk around the space, I just invite you to be in the space in a way that um, works well for your body minds. Um, I've reminded you about manuscripts that, that, that are available both in the chat and here. Christine has them if you need them here in the room and other people can put them in the chat for you. Um, and we have those for both my uh, lecture and for Kyle's response. Um, and if some of you would like to not have the lecture filling up your screens, just a reminder that you, if you're on Zoom, you can go to view options and choose side-by-side -side mode and gallery view so that you can have part of the screen with this lecture slide and um, part of the screen with me or with all of us. And again, if you experience any barriers to access, please let us know. Christian worship assumes the necessity and beauty of human creatures gathered before God and called together in relationship through God to one another. So liturgical theologian Gordon Lathrop argues that assembly, a gathering together of participating persons, constitutes the most basic symbol of Christian worship. Think about that for a minute. We are, whatever we are doing in this space, we are saying something about who God is. Lathrop reminds us that all other symbols of worship require this assembly of people in the first place. He writes, from the initial remembrance of baptism that joined us to the assembly, to the common singing of the assembly, to the opening greeting that intends to surround us all verbally with the life of the triune God, to the book opened as our communal book, to the meal as our communal meal, to the common dismissal, all will be a shared action. 
At the heart of these social obligations of Christian worship is a liturgical anthropology. By that I mean it's an understanding of the human person that emphasizes communal knowledge and individual participation as necessary for the worship of God. So emphasizing worship as collaborative work and as common prayer, I will speak today about the importance of practicing anti-ableism in worship as the responsibility, not simply of one or two people or of a special ministry or of a committee, but as a collective commitment of those of us who worship God together. So first, I will begin by saying something about my own identity and involvement with disability and theology. It's important to name my like, own location. Second, I will describe a field of academic scholarship known as disability studies and its implications for understanding disability in ways that may be countercultural to many of the contexts that, that we, um, in which we minister. Third, I will talk about the implications of some different models of disability for Christian worship, as well as some reasons Christians must address ableism in worship and expand our theological imagination regarding human embodiment. And finally, I will draw on the work of North American disability theologian and sociologist of religion, Nancy Eastland, to discuss some ways that Christian churches practice ableism in worship and I will also offer some suggestions for transforming Christian practices and theologies of disability and ableism. So th this is a roadmap, and there's sort of an outline on the screen of where we're going today together. At several points throughout the lecture, I will invite you to stop and either reflect on your own or talk with another person near you, just to give you an opportunity to, um, to think about your own context. So first I want to begin with my own identity and my commitment to anti-ableism in my own life and work. I am a white, straight, cisgendered, married woman without children who owns a home and who has a position of power in a theological institution. I am not ordained, but I am an active lay leader in a Mennonite church in Atlanta. And before I became um, an associate dean, I studied at Emory, and I was part of and I was educated by a group of scholars with and without disabilities who deepened my understanding of the importance of scholarship and activism that engages experiences of disability. So as part of my PhD, I spent three years doing theological and ethnographic research um, in a church where there were people with and without diagnoses of mental illness, and they worshiped together in ways that were unusual for many Christian churches. So in this slide is the cover of a book that I wrote that emerged from this research. The title, The Disabled Church, is in green on a cream cover, and there is a piece of art that someone in the congregation made on the cover. It's a painting of a loom on a red background next to a table overflowing with spools of colorful thread. There are also spools of thread on a table below the painting. So one of the metaphors I consider for worship in that book is that of weaving. In what ways are we woven into common worship with and through difference? So while I'm not a person who identifies as, disabl as disabled, I have been profoundly shaped by communities that pay critical attention to the church through the lens of disability. And these communities have changed the ways I think about what it means to be in relationship with God and with other Christians. They have also helped me to understand how important the active presence and leadership of people with disabilities is for our communities. I am still working to transform ableist assumptions within myself and within systems from which I benefit, assumptions that have been harmful to disabled people in every community and every institution that I have ever been a part of. I also want to say that I'm very aware that disability has been identified and understood in different ways, in different cultural contexts, and in different periods of history. Disability is always informed by its intersections with other experiences of minoritization, such as race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and gender. Thus, to ask questions about disability justice is also to ask about other social locations and other forms of identity uh, difference, power, privilege, and oppression that shape this experience. I think that's important to name at the outset. So before I continue, I want to invite you into a brief reflection exercise to stimulate your thinking about your own church context. How would you describe your congregation or your community, if you're not part of a congregation's 
Relationship to Disabled People and Disability in Worship. And I offer some categories for you to consider, but you may want to suggest a different kind of category than one I have up here. So on the slide, I have exclusion, tolerance, charity, hospitality, inclusion, or justice. So I'm going to invite you, you can either think on your own or maybe you want to turn to someone sitting right next to you and share. Um, or if you're in Zoom, you want to put something in the chat. I'm just going to invite you to reflect for about a minute on this. So I'm sure we could keep talking about this for a while, and I hope that you will, maybe after this lecture and in the weeks and days to come. Um, but I'm going to invite you back um, now and uh, speak from my own experience. In different churches and communities to which I have belonged, the attitude toward disability have typically ranged from tolerance to desires to be more hospitable. Some churches I've known are even doing work on inclusion. But rarely have these congregations been ready to do the difficult work of confronting ableism and thinking about disability justice. So when I, when I speak about disability justice in a church context, I'm thinking about transformation of theology and practice in regards to ableism, disability, and disabled people. I'm also thinking about different kinds of procedural, distributive, and reparative justice. That is justice through policies, resources, and sustained work to repair histories of harm. In a church context, I understand this to mean that predominantly abled ecclesial spaces are transformed so that disabled people have access to all parts of church life and leadership and that non-disabled people practice solidarity and advocacy to ensure social policies, rights, and resources that people with disabilities deserve. So I understand disability to be an ordinary part of embodied human life rather than a tragedy to be pitied or overcome. And this understanding has been shaped by an academic field of study known in North America as disability studies. Um, disability studies is a discipline that asks questions about how we understand what it means to be normal and also questions how our societies enforce particular expectations of normalcy. So I'm curious, reflect, would you consider yourself normal? And if so, what are, what are the criteria, I mean, what are the criteria you would use to measure that? What are the ways that you would use, what are your assessment measures for that? Who's telling you that? Disability studies thus privileges and prioritizes human differences over human sameness or similarities. It challenges the idea that there is a normal human body or person. So it thinks of this as an illusion. It also challenges the ways we conceive of what scholar Robert McRuer calls, quote, compulsory able-bodiedness. Um, 
That is our expectations about what bodies and persons should be able to do in order to be counted as full human persons in the world. Should you be able to sit through a lecture for an entire day, for example. Every person moves through and navigates the world differently, but the social and cultural worlds we live in are designed to support and sustain some people more than others. So disability studies focuses attention on the knowledge, wisdom, and experience of disabled people and disability communities regarding their own lived experiences. Finally, disability isn't a special condition that affects just a few people. With 61 million people in the U.S. living with a disability, disability affects all of us in some way through our experiences of embodiment, through familial connections, through processes of aging. Some scholars use the term, quote, temporarily able-bodied, unquote, to speak about those of us who are currently non-disabled. But at the same time, we are not all disabled or differently abled. Disability marks a, a particular social location and experience of minority identity. While experiences of disability may differ, it's important to name this identity in order to understand both disability culture and coalition building, and also to understand particular forms of oppression that not all of us experience in the same way. So disability studies thus challenges a primary way of understanding disability in a North American context, that is through the medical or individual model. So in the medical model, Disability is understood as a problem within an individual body and mind. For example, if a person is born blind or becomes blind, they are expected to resolve that problem by figuring out how to live in a society that expects everyone to be sighted and should be able to see. Thus, the proper approach to disability in the medical model is not to learn to live well with a disability, but rather is to correct, normalize, or eliminate that disability. A disabled person is expected to want their disability to be fixed or healed, to be as able-bodied as possible. In a medical model, there's also a, a focus, and I spoke of this earlier, on individual responsibility for the disabling experience. A disabled person is expected to figure out how they can adapt to and survive in a political, social, and cultural environment that is often not conducive to their survival or flourishing. So I'm going to offer some image descriptions where I have images. In this slide is a painting of a tall man in gray clothes in a gray wheelchair. There is a small sailboat behind him on a pedestal and a window revealing a sky with gold-tinted clouds. The artist Sasha Neve painted the actor Christopher Reeve, who advocated for medical research in regards to cures for spinal cord injuries. So the field of disability studies offers a number of other models that give other understandings of disability. And while there are more than two models of disability and nuances I will not take time to explore today, I want to talk about a general sort of contrasting model, the social or cultural model of disability. So in this model, the experience of disability is a product of social relations and environments rather than the condition of an individual. For example, all of us require accommodations to be able to live and relate to one another. We might consider, for example, all of the kinds of technology that are being used right now to support our participation. This environment has been adapted to help someone with a body-mind like mine to lecture in this space. But frequently, the environments we live in and teach in have not been adapted to help support body minds that fall outside of our expectations for what a normate human body is and does. Thus, people with disabilities often experience barriers to the kinds of resources and supports that other people expect to have. Such assumptions are ableism at work, manifesting who is worthy of accommodation and whose accommodations fall outside of the scope of what is considered essential or reasonable. In this model, the proper approach to disability is to transform social and architectural barriers and to ask what disabled people need in order to flourish as autonomous individuals and interdependent members of society. And in this model, the future is focused on eliminating social and environmental barriers to full inclusion. This includes transforming stigma and oppressive assumptions that many people bring to their experience of disability and to their assessment of their own bodies. So in this slide, a woman is sitting on a wall holding a feather as a bluebird flies above her into a tree. 
This is a painting by a disabled artist, Riva Lair, of a disabled scholar and activist, Rebecca Mascos, who is working to create a more vibrant disability culture in Germany. So before we continue, I'm going to invite you to reflect again on the ways that disability is understood or spoken of or preached about or taught about in the cultural context in which you come from. So take a few minutes to think about or turn to a person next to you or share in the chat. What are some ways that, disabil that, that disability is spoken of or thought about um, in the context in which you come from? Mm Again, I'm sure you could talk about this for some time, and I hope you will, but let's come back together. So I now want to speak to you about how a social and cultural model of disability can affect our practices of worship, Christian worship. So from a disability studies perspective, we must begin by asking whether or not each worshiper has access to other worshipers. All of us, do we have access to one another and to the spaces and forms of prayer and praise that a congregation engages? Those of us who plan and lead worship often expect that people who come to worship will participate in a similar way, standing, sitting, reading, seeing, hearing, speaking, attending, or being present, or being quiet. Um, there are assumptions about the bodies and abilities of each person who gathered. So I oversee two chapel services every week and embedded in almost every element of a service, prayers, songs, sermons, communion, practices of gathering and sending, um, those assumptions are present. Many times these assumptions do not take into account all of the ways that worshipers experience and encounter God. So practicing anti-ableism in worship invites us to ask, what are people expected to be able to do to participate in the communal worship of God? What assumptions do we make about the people who gather, about our own bodies and abilities, and about our participation, and about the kinds of time and space we need to worship? About what counts as a faithful response and what counts as a disruption? When we celebrate full, active, and conscious participation of those who worship together, how are we defining full, active, and conscious? If, if we start to imagine the full range of human difference and variation that may be present, alongside different barriers to and modes of full participation, dismantling anti-ableism may feel impossible. When I'm teaching about disability in ministry and seminary and my students begin to just, their, they begin to consider all of the human differences that might be present in any gathering, one of them typically exclaims, we can't possibly accommodate all human differences in worship. It's a visceral reaction. I believe that my students' reactions are a common response to the requests of disabled worshipers in churches and communities we can't possibly do all that you're asking us to do. 
to begin with an assumption about human differences rather than human sameness or uniform participation stretches our theological imaginations in ways that make us uncomfortable at times. For to do so also challenges the resources we allocate to intentionally create spaces where all people have access to God. Furthermore, the desire to begin with human differences in worship interrogates deeply held beliefs about human ability that have shaped Christian theology and worship. And finally, our, cult our ways of perceiving other people are deeply shaped by cultural perceptions regarding what it means to be a good person and to have a body that is worth loving and caring for, to have quality of life. So to work from the idea or assumption of a single body is far easier and more comfor comfortable than to begin with the assertion that God has created and loves many different ways of being an embodied creature in the world and many ways of worshiping God. Can we begin to imagine our common worship such that each person's flourishing matters to God and to each other, and each person's flourishing also matters to my worship of God? Do we believe that in order to worship God, we need all of our siblings in Christ? If our worship is just, it will reflect the love and desire that God has for each person and for just relationships. In worship, we are granted an opportunity to practice our anticipation of the kinds of spaces where all creatures of God can flourish together with and before God. While this may sound very romantic, it is hard work. Right now, we exist in what Nancy Eastland names as a communion of struggle to imagine and practice that reality. But as disability activists pictured here, Alice Wong, Mia Mingus, and Sandy Ho remind us, access is love. The creation of access is never merely a set of logistics for a few people to figure out. Access to and through one another is a collective practice of love for one another. In a Christian context, creating access to and with one another is both necessary for worship, we can't worship without it, and it is the holy work of the people of God. Image description that comes from the site where I took this image, photo of three disabled Asian American women, Mia Mingus, Alice Wong, and Sandy Ho, from left to right. Mia is wearing glasses and large hoop earrings. Alice is wearing a brightly colored scarf and an army camouflage print jacket. She is wearing a mask over her nose and with a tube for her BiPAP machine. Sandy has wavy short hair and is wearing a black sweater. Behind them is a concrete wall with a door. So now I want to borrow a concept from theologian Don Saliers. He talks about worship as humanity at full stretch. Um, and I reinterpret his, his kind of interpretation of this. In this framework, if we are to bring all of what it means to be human to God, all of our human suffering and desire to the character of God, that is to the love and to the justice of God, we need each other. We need all of our human differences to bring before God in order for God to receive the praise and prayer that is due God so that we offer the fullness of the humanity that God has both created and saved, the fullness of the humanity that God entered into through the incarnation of Jesus Christ and made possible through the spirit of access. We offer back this humanity in our worship to the justice of God, so as to better know who we are before God and with each other, and so as to know how God knows, loves, saves, and calls each one of us. So how do Christians foster in ourselves, in our, in our communities, this theological perspective? And how can we value the particular experiences and knowledge that those among us who are disabled bring to the church's worship and witness? So to do so, I believe we, we need to begin with the ableism that prevents us from this vision, pre prevents us from participating in our own and others' humanity at full stretch before God. So to think about ableism that is so deeply embedded in our Christian practices of worship, I want to engage some work by the scholar Nancy Eastland. Um, she wrote a very important book in the field of disability theology called The Disabled God, A Liberatory Theology of Disability. This slide shows the cover of Eastland's book, The Disabled God. It has a red cover and includes a photo of Pablo Picasso's abstract painting of the crucifixion. If you haven't read this book, 
I would highly recommend it. I believe it should be required reading for all seminarians and all ministers. So Eastland identifies three ways that Christians have perpetuated ableist theologies of disability. And lest you think you already know these, they show up in worship practices that I'm involved with all of the time. So think again. The first is sin disability conflation. The second is virtuous suffering or inspiration. And the third is segregationist charity, where people are thought of as dependent or needy. And I'm going to talk about each of them and uh, uh, sort of unfold their meanings. So first, in the concept of sin disability conflation, disability is associated directly or indirectly with sin in the world. In some Christian communities, there is an assumption that a person or their family has sinned, and thus it is assumed that a person is born with or experiences a disability because of a particular sin. But in other churches, there is an assumption that disability is in the world only because the creation itself is sinful, evil, or fallen. So in the future that God promises when evil and sin are no longer present with us, there will also no longer be any disability or disabled people. Thus, in both very explicit and very subtle ways, disability becomes associated with language or symbols of sin or evil in the world. Second, in the practice of identifying disability with virtuous suffering, disabled people are understood as inspiration for abled people. Some disabled people may be told their their disability was given them by God as a test or that they are being used as an example to make the faith of other Christians stronger. While this may seem like a better option than associations with sin and evil, disabled people are still viewed as objects of other people's spiritual and religious lives rather than as what Eastland calls theological subjects and historical actors. Third, in the practice of segregationist charity, churches and Christians wish to help people with disabilities and organize special ministries for them, but do not really want to change their theologies, symbols, practices, or networks of relationships in order to recognize the gifts of people with disabilities in the life of the church. Again, in this attitude, disabled people become objects of other people's desire to do good deeds in the world, rather than being understood as Christian subjects who contribute to the life and ministry of the church. So thankfully, Eastland not only diagnoses ableist theologies, but she also gives us a roadmap. She identifies practices of transformation that Christian churches should engage. And she begins with naming injustice. Let's let's name these sins. Churches have to name and confess the ways they have participated in injustice to disabled people and communities. For many churches, that means critically reflecting on the images and theologies of disability that are used in worship all of the time, as well as common interpretations of biblical texts. It also means analyzing understandings and practices of charity and healing that have been explicitly or implicitly harmful. In a recent Sojourners article, disability activist Shannon Dingle writes, I love the church. I can't and won't give the church up, no matter how wounded I feel. Yet I know more disabled people who have left the church than who have stayed. And I know more parents who have left after giving birth to or adopting children with disabilities than who have stayed. She continues to describe a relentless and harmful indifference and or resistance to disabled people's presence and participation in church. She goes on, disabled people didn't leave the church. The church didn't even leave us. No, we were never welcome. When we choose the brave act of entering a church, we are declaring that we will resist the ableism they have baptized, protesting civilly by being present at all. Dingle reminds abled Christians that so many of the roadmaps to transforming ableism and seeking disability justice that we've been given for years have been neglected or avoided, perpetuating harm. Second, disabled people at the speaking center. So to transform theologies of disability, churches must center the stories, voices, and leadership of disabled people, lay people, theologians, pastors, scholars, and activists. This means that churches need to ordain or appoint more disabled people to positions of authority and ministry in their communities. And to do that means dismantling the barriers that prevent people with disabilities from studying or teaching in theological schools or from leadership in the church. 
It also means those of us who are non-disabled must believe people with disabilities when they say they need something in order to um, participate in community and when they request forms of access and accommodation. As believers, not only in God, but also of the witness of our siblings, we who are able must educate ourselves about the realities of disabled people both within and outside of worship spaces. This involves knowledge of the conditions that may affect people's participation in worship, access to transportation, health care, home care, safe and affordable housing, technology, and access to jobs and education. Addressing ableism in worship means not only considering who is present in worship spaces, but also asking questions about who is absent, as well as investigating the structures that may prevent some of us from gathering in the first place. Third, transformation of liturgical symbols and practices. So third, Eastland suggests that Christians must engage the primary theological symbols and practices that shape our Christian worship and faith in order to ask questions about these symbols in light of disability experience. Only when primary symbols, names, and images for God and for God's work begin to change can we imagine Christian communities where all people can flourish together, giving God praise and prayer that is due God. So this here is an image of the artist Caravaggio's painting. So I think next slide. Yeah, this is an image of the artist Caravaggio's painting of Thomas putting his finger in Jesus' side with two other disciples, three, three other disciples looking on. Eastland offers one example of what it means to transform Christian symbols by critically and devotionally reflecting on the risen Christ as the disabled God, the one who returns to his disciples with a different body than the one they had known a body that was disabled by experience, his experiences on the cross. And this is important. Jesus returned to his disciples not as a heroic overcomer, nor as a tragic figure, but as a survivor. At first, even his closest friends didn't recognize him. He didn't leave his disability behind, but he incorporated it into his own identity, and this experience changed him. So the risen Christ as disabled God helps each of us to refuse the logic of heroic overcoming where superhero individuals must overcome insurmountable barriers to access and instead offers us the power of the Holy Spirit to imagine and practice the conditions for collective flourishing. A disabled worshiper reflecting on her experiences of worship with me recently cited a favorite scripture which she had reinterpreted. We can do all things through God who gives us strength, she reminded me. The I in the phrase turn to we serves as a call to churches that have often declared it impossible to address ableist structures and practices. Citing insufficient resources or people or knowledge or enough disabled people to warrant changes in a building or a way of gathering, congregations and theological institutions deny basic forms of access again and again. In light of such systemic resistance, the disabled Christian I spoke with evoked the power of God in and through God's people, a people who must live within and respect embodied limits and a people with power to reprioritize and re-examine the logics of impossibility that bolster ableist practices in order to reallocate time and resources to this collective work. So what would it mean for us gathered here today to assume our collective responsibility and the power of God among us, us here, to engage in anti-ableist practice without requiring that a few of us become heroic overcomers and superheroes, dismantling barriers or obstacles on behalf of the rest of us? I want to suggest just a few ways, and I imagine our panelists this afternoon will offer us many more ideas, and Kyle will also have ideas to offer us. In my experience, um, many congregations want to respond to disability through special ministries or programs. I've said that before, I'm just going to say it again. Rather than an understanding of disabled people and Christians as those who can be ministers and leaders. So some churches and Christians are asking questions about hospitality. They're asking, what should we do to welcome people with disabilities? And these are really important questions. 
Hospitality is vital and critical practice to the ministry of congregations and for Christian worship. But it is also not enough. A focus on hospitality can even perpetuate harm when it distracts from the transformation of harmful theologies. For engaging anti-ableism isn't just about including disabled people in church or, or worship. It is also about non-disabled people's relationship with our own bodies and abilities and with ableist policies and structures that privilege some of us while denying resources to others. So here are the practices I'm going to talk about, and they may or may not be in the order on the slide that I, anyway, I'll guide you through the slide. So first, centering leaders with diverse experiences of disability is the first. Can we make sure that people with diverse experiences of disability are represented in leadership in our ministries, institutions, and coalitions without forms of cultural taxation or undue expectation? Can we allocate resources to make this possible, integrating anti-ableist work into our strategic plans and annual goals? Can we make sure that courses on disability theology and ministry are taught and integrated into our curriculums, not simply as electives or options for a few people, but as part of the core curriculum and our core educational initiatives in our churches? Second, creating accessible space and time. An anti-ableist approach to space means engaging in an accessibility audit to consider not only ramps and elevators, but also transforming segregated forms of seating and inaccessible pulpits and choir lofts, widening doorways, transforming bathrooms and baptismal pools. Such an audit, audit also requires attention to different kinds of sensory experiences. These changes will require discerning preference, that is what some people with privilege may want or call tradition, from access, that is what some minoritized people may need in order to participate in interpreting, interrogating, and passing on the traditions of the church. Such audits will require consideration of who can enter our, homes, our own home spaces and other spaces and times in which we gather outside of worship or church space. Preaching, reading, and singing of scripture. Can we teach, pray, and sing scripture in ways that do not objectify disability, but that consider disability as a critical lens for engaging, interpreting, and proclaiming scripture, and that consider disabled people in the Bible as more than metaphors for abled people's experiences? Can we rewrite or adapt the lyrics of hymns and songs that reinforce negative stereotypes of disability and write new hymns and songs that draw on the wisdom of disability experience? Can we imagine God's future for us as not one in which disabilities are reversed or transformed, the blind see, the lame walk, but one in which conditions that keep people with disabilities from flourishing are addressed and transformed? Healing practices. Can we interrogate and expand our thinking and understanding and preaching and praying about healing, wholeness, brokenness, wellness, and health so that our prayers for healing do not encourage dreams of eradicating or eliminating disability and do not place the burden of dreams for healing on disabled bodies and people? Encouraging and recognizing multiple forms of participation is the last one I'm going to, I could talk about many more, but this is the last one I'm going to talk about. How might we expand and multiply our body practices of worship and of sacraments and ordinances so that more people can participate in different kinds of ways together at the same time? We have an idea. Can our instructions and rubrics encourage a multiplicity of planned and improvised responses so that our performances of unity don't assume and enforce uniformity? God is calling the church to new ways of understanding and living in solidarity because the church needs the presence and witness of people with disabilities and because ableism harms all of us, creating barriers to access to our own bodies and with one another and God. So in this slide, I think it's the next slide. Uh -huh. A man in a wheelchair is at the foot of a flight of stairs trying to enter a church that has a sign that says, All are welcome, disabled at church disabled access, although there is no way to enter. And I think the image reveals a discrepancy between what we often say about ourselves and our actual practices. 
And finally, practice of solidarity will require joining alongside disability-centered communities in advocacy for issues that affected, affect disabled people both within and outside the walls of our institutions. So just yesterday, a group of disability organizations and activists kept vigil for 24 hours at the Capitol to try to ensure that funding for home and community-based care was not cut from President Biden's Build Back Better plan and to testify to the struggles of disabled people to access home and community-based care and to make money to support their families. Are we aware of these moment movements in order to support them? So in this slide, we see a group of disabled protesters gathered to fight within a political arena for policies and resources they need during President Obama's administration. They gave him an F on leadership, integrity, and engagement. And in the next slide, a protest that occurred during President Trump's administration. So we see the protests continue. This one is taken from above, almost as if someone came down through the roof. Um, looking down on a group of people who are setting up protests with police around them in wheelchairs and without wheelchairs. Um, and it says something about medic and life and liberty disabled, the sign they're holding there as a, as a form of protest. Um, so as we, as we transition now, I know that was a lot of words, and I'm going to um, turn over the um, words to Kyle now. But before we do that, let's sing together, just to be in our bodies in a different kind of way to stretch, to move. Again, feel free to move about the space and to move in and out if you need to take a break before Kyle comes. Thank you so much for your attention. There is a gift in this way of being together and maybe you just want to actually stand for a moment, friends, as you're able or if you're willing. Don't, you don't need to do that, but if you feel like your body wants to sort of Will you just sing with me? La, 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 la. Let's try that. La, 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 la. Keep going. La, 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 la. Keep going. Summoned by the God who made us rich in our diversity. Keep going. Gathered in the name of Jesus, richer still in unity. Keep going. Let us bring the gifts that differ and in splendid varied ways sing a new church into being one in faith and love and pray. You might be tired of that now. <laughs> Let's sing together the second verse. Radiant risen, radiant risen from the water, rolled in holiness and light. Every person in God's image, every person God's delight. Let us bring the gifts that differ and in feeling a little more oxygenated? Good. Thank you to Dr. Schroeder for inviting me to respond to such a rich lecture. And thanks again, even the community, that the wise baker and present for the rich. Uh, Hospitality 
General Tits. I am honored to be with you all and engage in this conversation. To name my social location, I am a black, middle class, queer, ordained, but the preacher with trivial poverty. I want to highlight and explore deeply what it means to move beyond hospitality and, and inclusion as Dr. Schroeder mentioned in her lecture to radical access and disability justice and anti-ableism to folks with disability have access to the life and service of an anti-ableist church. The shift from hospitality to anti-ableist work is imperative because it asserts that people with disabilities are needed in the church's life. Our presence, our perspective, our theologies and interpretations are needed. As opposed to the attitude that the disabled bodies need the assistance and accommodations from able bodies. The church, that the church is a service for people with disabilities. And that people with disabilities have no inherent qualities that can add to the church that can aid, that can aid the church's mission to grow, teach, preach, and just do the mission because people with disabilities are its mission. An example of this could be, as she mentioned, a, would be a special needs ministry or a ministry for, for for people with disabilities. Well, it could provide a safe space for people with disabilities to process their experience together, occurring, if you will. The, this model for disability does not push non-disabled people to examine their privilege. Their privilege. The work is more than just ensuring that people with disabilities are welcome to worship or able to participate in programs and that the church is and that the church building is, is accessible, but also an intentional effort of those who do not identify as having a disability, unlearning, unlearning the, theology that presumes that their body and mind are normal an ideal, um, and people with disabilities through though so included are not normal or ideal. Anti-ableist worship transforms non-disabled folks' relationship with their own body as Dr. Schroeder has said. From a well-examined theology of disability, 
then and only then can the church implement changes to policy, practice, physical structure, and overall church, cu church culture that allows ministry with, with persons with disabilities. Moreover, the concepts can be sum summarized in what disability theologian Thomas Reynolds calls the cult of norm normalcy. Reynolds says, the cult of normalcy deals with bodily variation by rendering them pathological and deficient vis-a-vis -vis reference points of power and privilege. So, speaking from my own social location, how can black churches begin to dismantle the cult of, of, of normalcy in our own churches? Preaching and singing are the two main modes of proclamation in black Baptist churches. And the Bible is also authoritative. Jesus does heal people in scripture. That happened. And those texts have often been the foundation for some of the church's history. A well known one was blind, but now I see. When the larger healing, whenever the larger healing ministry of Jesus is written in a song or a healing text is preached, the emphasis is on a restoration of a disabled body to a non-disabled body, asserting that a non-disabled body is a divine ideal. The scholar Kathleen Black calls this a hermeneutic of cure as opposed to healing. A hermeneutic is a cure of a cure is solely concerned with the elimination of disability and the restoration to a normal, to a normative able body mind. For example, churches church typically read today's scripture from service they would read and assume that the, based on Jesus' response that the cause of his disability was sin. And the denouement of the story was that the man was healed and that he walked. That the denouement was that he walked. A hermeneutic of healing, a black suggests, is concerned with well being and peace with oneself in the God given body and mind as persons with and without disabilities. Simply put, one does not need to be cured. to be healed. Furthermore, I can I contend 
the, an overemphasis on cure and a healing touch misses the essence of the gospel that is being illustrated. These texts, I believe, are pointing to the salvific identity of Jesus. For instance, this story illustrates that, that illustrates the, the authority of Jesus to forgive sins proven by his healing power simply because he is the Messiah. Finally, the resurrection is, is central to my theology as a, a preacher. The resurrected body of Jesus is not cured of disability that he attained at the, the crucifixion as the late sociologist and disability theologian Nancy Ethan argues. The theologian Professor Harold Trulier notes that black Christians find solidarity in Christ's death and in their hope for resurrection. Yet they are the kind We say in black, but we church it all the time. He died, he died, did he die? But early Sunday, but early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand. And in those same hands are the marks of disability. Thus, if the resurrection of the de of the dead, thus if the general resurrection of the dead is when the faithful are made like Jesus Christ. Our glorified bodies will also have whatever march of the two we have in, in this life. It's not that heaven erases the two but heaven is accessible. Thus, the crucified and risen Jesus and the establishment of his reign is the good news of a disabled God coming to bring an accessible new earth and new heaven. This is what I believe is at the heart of what is being commemorated and celebrate it respectively in the Lord's Supper. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussion.